Hi, this is Greg Mangle for Gamers Guide to Life, and I'm here with Paul Wedgwood, CEO of Splash Damage and the director of Brink, which is the much-anticipated game that Bethesda is publishing. And um, first of all, Paul, how are you? Yeah, good, really good. That's good. Yeah. All right, well, we got a couple questions for you. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one's a really broad one. Imagine our viewers are all aliens, and uh, they've just landed from a different planet, and they see Brink, and they want to hear about it. What would you tell them, knowing nothing about anything? Well, you know, Brink, it's a shooter, first and foremost. So you're looking down the barrel of a gun and shooting at other people. And I think that's kind of key to the game, because we need to make sure that we don't forget those basic roots. And as a visceral shooter, it's really important that it looks great, sounds great, feels good. But what Brink really does differently are probably two or three things. First of all, you know, it takes place in a, a world that players haven't seen before. It's an immense artificial floating city built at sea as part of a contemporary green vision, but now existing around 2045, it's lost contact with the rest of the Earth and it's become the focus of an isolated and horrific conflict between competing social factions. As a player, you enter the game around now and that and around then and you choose whether you're going to fight as the resistance or the security. And depending on your choice, you have a very different experience with a different story, different cinematics. Now, irrespective of whether you choose to play the game offline and online, it's really no different. You can play single player, cooperatively or competitively. You're still going to advance your same in-game character. So all those actions that are successful that earn your experience points, that you spend on cool outfits, on cool weapons, unlocks, upgrades, tools, gadgets, items, all of that stuff sticks with you no matter how you choose to play the game. So you don't kind of get to the end of single player and then lose all of your stuff and start again online. You've been building up a character that you've invested in and it sticks with you. That's awesome. And, um, you know, with that respect, when you're talking about these two different campaigns that you can run for security or for resistance, you know, what do you think the main differences are? Either, like, um, probably not in gameplay, but in story and narrative. Uh, I mean, you right. probably can't tell us too much, but no, what can sure, you tell us? Mind. Well, cool. you know, the big difference really is that when you're fighting for the resistance, they represent the refugees. These refugees started arriving around 2020, initially from nearby atolls that had been flooded, which kind of spread the rumors that the reason that they're isolated is because of the Earth's rising oceans. But nobody knows for sure. All they know is that there's no ships going past, there's no planes overhead, and there's complete radio silence. But they've been running low on resources for 20 years, and it's the refugees that are suffering most. So the resistance, they're fighting for a fairer distribution of those resources for the refugees against what they consider to be an oppressive security force. Now, this security force represents the founders. But when you play for them, you don't see yourself as the bad guys. They think the resistance are little more than terrorists and that they're just trying to maintain law and order. And it's that kind of confusing and confounding view of war, of civil war, that I think we try and do in this game. We don't really pick one side and say they're the good guys or the bad guys. We tell the story from both perspectives so you get to experience those two completely different views. That's good. And, uh, you know, it's... I mean, without speaking out of turn, it sounds like kind of a rarity uh, for the FPS genre to have such stories. So that's that's good to hear. Um, you know, got to tell us about uh, Brink's smart system a little bit. You know, how does it enhance the game in an open, in open or a limited sense? Well, you know, the idea behind smart is really straightforward. Smart stands for smooth movement across random terrain. Anybody that's ever played a shooter knows how frustrating it can be. You know, when you walk up to a table and because it's two inches too high, you can't jump on top of it. Or a wall, you know, it's only this high, but I can't climb over the top. And I can't slide under anything at all. And even if I do have some kind of you know, moment where I press a button to interact with something, I go into some hideous can cinematic that takes over control and I'm not in control of my player anymore. But what Smart does, without being an autopilot, is give you a system that just allows you to move fluidly through the environment, but most importantly, move fluidly and shoot. It doubles up as a sprint button, our smart button, and when you're running along, you can use it to just vault straight over something and slide. Or if I run towards something that's like a bit taller than me, I can look up and jump up and climb up and over the top of it. If I'm just running towards a railing, I can just vault across the top. I can look down, hit, crouch, slide, and then turn and start shooting at stuff as I come sliding around a corner. So it's really just a method of removing those artificial and frustrating constraints. Sounds great. You know, after having just tested it too, uh, it seems to be working really well. Oh, thanks. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> um, let's see here. The next one, I think I'll be... Uh, the first-person shooter genre is ridiculously saturated at the moment, with many different games and genres jostling for space and consumer attention. How have you worked to make Brink different from the hundreds of other generic FPS games currently being released? 
Well, you know, I think the thing is, there are a lot of shooters around, but shooters are also the biggest genre in video games. So it's no surprise that there are a lot of people doing them. It's like blockbuster action movies. You know, you get a bunch of those every year as well. I think the great thing about Brink is that not only are we advancing the way that you control the game in such a way that when you go and play the shooters, it actually feels frustrating because you can't do all of those cool moves. But also when you're playing through the game single player and you've invested all this time in a character, you know what, you can take that character online and play cooperatively with your friends. And when you've had enough time doing that, you can go online, you know, as an experienced player and start playing in full competitive matches against people. And all of this stuff that you're doing, your kind of character customization, weapon modification, uh, buying cool abilities, just continuously rewards you with new things that are fun. So rather than just being a kind of eight, 10 hour experience and then it's done, if you look at the very first game we ever made, Wolfenstein Enemy Territory, people are still playing it seven years later, half a billion matches played online, uh, 15 million downloads and still in the top three most, mo most played multiplayer shooters. So I think if you go and play Brink, this is not something you're gonna be playing for a few days, it's something you could play for months. That's great. You know, speaking of the online play, since we're addressing it, um, many games I'll promise a, a seamless online experience. It's a bold thing to, to say that you're going to have, just as Brink cites one. Um, many don't deliver on the promise. Is Brink's online experience truly seamless, or is there some menu surfing and login handling required? And if it is uh, there, is it substantial? Well, you know, as we're showing today, uh, when you were playing through the game yourself, in fact, as long as you're logged into PSN and as long as I'm on your friends list, you don't need to do anything at all. If you launch a game and you're playing and you've set the mode to friends and invite, if I come online, I can just connect. I'm just in there playing with you straight away. We don't have to form a party. We don't have to go into a lobby. We don't have to chat over VOIP to work out what map we're going to do or any of that stuff. I can just jump straight into your game in real time with my character fully upgraded and all of his abilities and everything. And you know what? If I come into there with really cool, cool abilities and I play really hard, the AI is going to adapt and give me a, a, a tough time. It doesn't matter even if you're new. That's awesome. Well, um, that's it for the scheduled questions. I think that uh, if I have one last thing to ask you, it would be this. I'm asking some people. Uh, if you could describe your game with one adjective, what would it be? Wow. Only one. Smooth. <laughs> Beautiful. Thanks so much for the interview. Everyone play Brink and continue going to Gamer's Guide to Life. This is Greg signing out. Thank you. Bye.